Now, yesterday we talked about how to use GC to tell what's in an essential oil. This morning we're going to talk about uh, resources to find out what ought to be in an essential oil. So I need to first talk about what is an essential oil. They're extracted by different methods. If it's a citrus oil, like orange oil or, le or lemon oil, it's pressed out of the peel. Most essential oils are distilled, and there are two types. Hydrodistillation is you uh, basically make a soup, you boil the steam away, condense the steam, and the oil separates from the, the uh, condensed steam. There's also steam distillation, which is slightly different. The plant material is not immersed in the boiling water, but the steam passes through the plant material and then is collected. There are similar things that are not essential oils, but they're related. So an enfleurage is uh, you take plant material and soak it in something like vegetable oil, and then, um, then you... Um, extract it with ethanol, and then boil the ethanol away, and what's left behind is an absolute. You can also have solvent extraction, where you use something like hexane to extract the, uh, the uh, volatile materials. The hexane evaporates, leaving behind uh, an absolute. And finally, there's supercritical fluid extraction, where you soak the plant material in carbon dioxide, liquid carbon dioxide, at high pressure. When you release the pressure, the carbon dioxide all evaporates and it leaves behind the extract. So what do, what do I mean by adulteration? Adulteration is the inclusion in a product of anything that really doesn't belong in the product. So it might be intentional, it might be a supplier trying to cut costs by selling you something that's only 50% what you think it is. It might be unintentional. Maybe as a part of the processing, there's uh, something introduced into the oil that doesn't belong there. So we could have dilution with less expensive solvents like hexane or diethyl phthalate. We could have blending with, um, non with region-specific oils. So you could have bourbon geranium cut with Chinese geranium, which is a less expensive oil. You could have blending, oil, blending oils from different parts of the plant. So cinnamon comes in two kinds. There's the leaf oil and the bark oil. They're sold as separate products, but if, uh, if, if one were blended together and sold as the bark oil, for example, that would be an adulteration. You could have blending of oils from different species. Lavender and lavendin smell very similar. Lavender is the cheaper oil, so you could adulterate lavender oil by including some lavender with it. You could blend oils from unrelated species, so geranium and lavender both have linalool and linalool acetate. Uh, you could cut lavender oil with geranium oil. And finally, you could blend oils with aromachemicals that are present in authentic oils, but not present in that particular oil. Linalool belongs in lavender oil, but you might cut lavender oil with linalool, something that belongs there, but not in the proportion that it belongs there. And finally, you could add things to the oil that really don't belong there. So benzyl alcohol doesn't belong in clove oil. But if you blend clove oil with benzyl alcohol, it smells okay, it smells like clove oil, but the benzyl alcohol is not a natural component of clove oil. Finally, you could have contaminations, unintentional contaminations from the processing of the sample. So what should be there? The, comp the problem is the composition varies by species, by region, by season, by extraction method, and um, uh, the plants are grown in the field, then they're shipped to a distiller who distills them, some, and a uh, wholesaler then would combine lots of oil from different distillers. So there's the possibility for adulteration at any of those steps. So the resources I use, Essential Oil Analysis by Kubexka, is a $615 book. Really, really good book. Uh, highly recommend it. <laughs> but this is also a good book. So Essential Oil Safety, the, the title makes you think it's just about uh, safe handling of essential oils, but in fact 
includes a lot of information about what should be in lavender oil. That's only $95. Uh, there's Essential Oil University. This is a uh, website that is subscription based. You pay $100 a year and you have access to thousands and thousands of GC reports for um, essential oils. And finally, this is the most expensive. ISO is an organization whose whole purpose in life is to make up rules for what should be in different things, peanut butter or whatever. Uh, they are the most expensive because they have a different spec for each essential oil and each one costs $100 or more. And so that's pretty expensive. So ISO puts out an exclusive spec. They're trying to exclude things that aren't genuine. So they make a very restrictive definition. Uh, for example, in uh, lavender oil, they specify it should be between 20 and 43 percent linalool, 25 percent and 47 percent linalool acetate. And they have eight or ten more specs for different compounds, all that should be in lavender oil. Of the 42 lavender oil species in the Essential Oil University database, 22 are excluded by the ISO spec. It's like half the, so these are all genuine oils, but the ISO spec is so restrictive that it marks as out of spec 22 of the 42 uh, uh, genuine lavender oil samples. So it, the goal of this is to accept, accept as genuine only typical lavender oils. I'm going to talk about an inclusive spec. So I've performed a statistical analysis of the essential oils on the Essential Oil University database. I've generated the 95% reference interval. That's an interval within which 95% of the samples fall and you'll see that graphically in a minute. It's going to, even then, going to reject 5% of the uh, genuine lavender oil samples. For example, uh, the 95% spec says linalool should be between 9 and 50% and linalool acetate between 4 and 57%. So you're all looking puzzled right now. I'm going to show you a picture which hopefully will make it a little bit clearer. So this is, on one axis, linalool acetate, on the other axis, linalool. This is the composition of an essential oil along those two axes. And the green box in the middle is the ISO spec. The larger box around it is the 95% reference interval. And if you count the dots, there are 42 of them. Those are the 42 lavender oils in the Essential Oil University database. And you see that many of them are excluded. They're outside of the ISO spec. But 95% of them are inside the larger green box, which is the 95% reference interval. The idea of a reference interval is used in medicine a lot. For example, I get a prostate exam every year. And they give me a report uh, about my level compared to the population. And there are two things they don't want to do. They don't want to tell me I have cancer when I don't. And they don't want to not tell me I have cancer when I do. So they use a 95% reference interval. 95% of normal healthy people will fall within that interval. 5% of normal healthy people will fall outside the interval. So we have the same thing going on here. Um, the 95% reference interval, interval will include more genuine oils than the ISO spec does but at the risk of also including some oils that might not be genuine. Now imagine this is a two-dimensional graph. It's got linalool acetate versus linalool. Imagine now a 12-dimensional graph because we don't just look at two components. We look at eight or 10 or 12 different components. So I'm going to give some examples now. This is, uh, this is our analysis of a lemongrass oil. On the left is the ISO spec, in the middle is the 95% reference interval, and I've highlighted in red anything that's out of spec. On the far right is our analysis of this lemongrass oil, 
and we find that uh, NERAL in lemongrass should be between 25 and 35 percent by the ISO spec. We find it at 35.6 percent. Now, is that a problem? What do you think? So there are a couple of reasons why I don't consider that a problem. One is I look at the 95% reference interval, it goes all the way to 40%, so I'm clearly within that. Also, if I do this analysis 10 times in a row, one time it's going to be 35.6, the other time it's going to be 35.4, another time it might be uh, 34.9. There's variation from one analysis to the other, so I don't consider that out of spec. Similarly with <laughs> geranial, should be between 35 and 47. We find it at 47.8. Again, I don't think that's a problem, and so I would have flagged this lemongrass oil as genuine. Here's a Pomerosa. Here we have some things that are out of spec, both by the ISO and by the 95% reference interval. The areas that need to be flagged are geranial, should be between 0.2 and 0.6, and we find it at 0.9. It's also out of spec for the reference interval. We also have a problem with karyophyllene at 3.6% compared to 2.5 or 2%. You know, those are two specs out of a long list, and so given the natural variation between oils, this is another oil that I didn't flag as problematic. Um, also, I have to think to myself, would somebody intentionally adulterate Pomerosa oil with an extra 0.3% of geranial? And I don't think that's a very reasonable suspicion to have. Here's a juniper berry oil, and it fails nearly all of the ISO specs. Uh, I won't go through them one by one, but if you look at the one that's problematic, the very first one is alpha pinene. We find it at 61.5% and the ISO spec is 45%. What do you think I should do with this one? It's within the 95% reference interval for everything and it's out of the ISO spec for nearly everything. Tell it at a discount? Yeah, maybe so. I mean, I don't, uh, I can't, I'm not going to flag this as adulterated. There's nothing in it that doesn't belong there. The proportions are a little bit out of spec for the ISO, and, but within the spec for reference interval. I'm simply going to inform Essential Depot that this is a little bit unusual as a, as a uh, juniper berry oil, but it isn't out of the larger spec. Here's a questionable lavender oil. And uh, the places where it has a problem, eucalyptol should be between 0 and 3%. We find it at 4%. This is within the, ISO, within the 95% reference interval for just about everything. It's out of spec for the ISO. And you might say, well, that's kind of like the juniper berry oil, except for one thing, and that's the very one at the bottom, diethyl phthalate. We find it at 1.3%. Diethyl phthalate doesn't belong in any essential oil. So um, it's not just that it's something that should be there in the wrong percentage, it actually should not be there. And uh, one, I have to ask myself, would somebody add 1.3% diethyl phthalate to an essential oil? There's really no economic incentive there. So how did it get there? Diethyl phthalate is a common plasticizer. Somewhere along the processing of this oil, I'll bet it was in a plastic container or running through a plastic tubing or some plastic was used and the diethyl phthalate leached into the, into the um, essential oil. I am going to flag this. Even though it's 95% reference interval for just about everything, I am going to flag it because of the 1.3% diethyl phthalate. And part of my goal in doing these analyses is to protect Essential Depot from criticism by their competitors. If a competitor saw 1.3% diethyl phthalate, they would, they would make hay out of it. Here's a bergamot oil. Uh, and the problem here 
The ISO spec doesn't list camphene at all. The 95% reference interval says between 0 and 0.2%. This is at 33%. A third of the sample is camphene, and it really doesn't belong there. It is an, it's not like diethyl phthalate. It's a natural component of essential oils, but it's not a natural component of bergamot oil. And so I consider this oil adulterated with camphene. So who cares? Why do we care about whether these 1.3% diethyl phthalate, give me a break, is that really going to hurt anybody? So the point of this is, um, is if, you bought a, if you bought a used car, is it a problem if it has transmission trouble? If they tell you it has transmission trouble, is it a problem? Would, should I, and I look at a car and, I, and they say, by the way, it has transmission problem. It's going to cost $800 to fix the transmission. I say, well, give me a good price on it. I'll buy it. That's not a problem, is it? But if they sell me a used car that has a transmission problem and they don't tell me about it, I consider that a problem. So there's nothing wrong with selling a fragrance oil that just smells nice and it's at a reasonable cost and you like it and everybody's happy. There's nothing wrong with selling a blend of essential oils. You can blend geranium oil and lavender oil and sell it as a blend and that's not a problem. Nothing wrong with selling a fragrance oil diluted with an inert solvent as long as uh, they tell you about it. There's nothing wrong with a synthetic version of a natural scent. The only problem comes when you label it as something other than what it is. So you can represent any of these as fragrances extracted from a, but when you say it's extracted from a specific plant, from a specific location, by a specific method, those things all ought to be correct when you buy an essential oil. <coughs> So how do you protect yourself? Wholesalers need to test samples of oils they're considering buying. When essential, oil is con uh, when essential Depot is considering buying a batch of lavender oil, they first send me a sample that I can test. I can then tell them, is this, uh, is this likely to be a genuine sample? And if so, then they can order the large batch. But it shouldn't end there. They should then also test the large batch because the supplier could have sent a good sample and then bait and switch sent them a large shipment of something that was different than the sample upon which the purchase was based. Um, something Essential Oil, uh, Essential Depot has started doing is uh, they're batch testing all of their essential oils and they're, then they're posting the analytical report to the website. So when you're considering buying an oil, you can go and look at my analysis of that oil. You can compare it to the information in Tisserand, which is a, 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 an affordable book. And um, then you can, there's truth in advertising then. This is what the oil contains. And um, you can decide whether that oil is one that you want to include in your product. So I am speeding through this. Um, I want to leave time for questions, but I literally, if I'm not, if I'm not in my car at 9.30, I'm going to be very nervous driving down the highway to get to the airport. So I'll field questions for 15 minutes, and then i got to run. Yeah. So if it were labeled as a synthetic, so uh, a fragrance oil could be synthetic or, or natural. Do I consider fragrance oils dangerous? I do not. But there are people that do. And they deserve, if they, if they don't want an artificial scent in their, pro in their product, they deserve to be able to buy a natural scent without being lied to. I wouldn't hesitate to you if you just mix 50-50 linalol and linalyl acetate, it's going to smell like lavender. Um, it's going to be missing some of the nuances that come from the minor components, but it's not going to smell mad. I wouldn't consider it dangerous. 
but I respect somebody who would consider it dangerous and doesn't want to buy a synthetic version. Yeah. I know a central heat pump doesn't sell the lab in the 4042, which holds up well in the cells. I mean, are any of them natural or not? Well, even lavender 4042, that's natural. Yeah. It's a blend. So there's a whole range of lavender oils. We saw 42, and they're all scattered across yeah. the map. So somebody that wants to make a 4042 will blend lavenders from different places in order to get that proportion of lavender of linalool to linoleic acetate. So that you got to ask Derek that. I don't that's not, not that's none of my business. Oh, okay. So if, you, if you're an aromatherapist and you're, you have uh, a worldview in which aromatherapy depends on all these things, you're not going to want the, you're not going to want a synthetic version. No. You're going to want all the things that you want in it. And while I might not share your belief, I defend your right to buy something that is correctly labeled. If you want to ask about aromatherapy, you need to ask an aromatherapist, which I am not. Well, I'm not saying it is, but it can be. I mean, it's one could make it synthetically. One could make it by blending different lavender oils. Is there a way to tell? Can you tell? It's, as you've seen, it's kind of difficult because there are gray areas. Yeah. It's, could, could an ingenious person fool me? Probably so. Um, um, it's the percent. It's the percentages of linalool and linoleic acetate. So it, it's a, it's an attempt. When you when you buy a Coke, the Coke is the same every time you buy it. You never open a Coke and you drink it and say this tastes different from the last Coke. So 4042 is an attempt to make a standardized lavender oil rather than the scatter shot that we see from the from the uh, natural population. I th I'm going to defer that to, to Derek or Susan because we, we aren't doing any testing on their fragrance oils. All of our testing is on the essential oils. Yeah. If you wanted to make your own essential oils by distilling them, uh, what would be uh, uh, one of the, the tougher, well, I know you haven't made them all yourself, but one of the, maybe you've heard of something that's really, really hard to distill or something. Um, I think if you picked something common like uh, lavender or geranium, and you can buy a still for, it's going to cost you several hundred dollars, and it's only going to make, it's only going to make a little bit of oil at a shot. So you're not, you're definitely gonna, not going to want to go into production to make, you know, lavender oil for your soap business. But um, if you want the experience of doing that, then a couple of hundred dollars, maybe up to a thousand dollars for a nice still. Uh, and there are lots of plant materials that you can distill. At our school this semester, we're going to be distilling hops. And because um, the professor's interested in hops, and so we're going we're to be doing that. It isn't, the, the, the principle of it isn't hard. And I could build a still for $20 that would distill an essential oil, but you're, you know, if you buy a nice distill, it's going to be a nicer experience for you. I have a question. Yeah. Um, just out of curiosity, uh, we see so many different essential oils, but then there are some things that are like noticeably missing. I mean, for example, why don't we have an apple essential oil or something like that? I mean, is there some reason why some plants just don't? Yeah, that's a good question. The question is, why don't we, why, why do we get some essential oils and not others? Why do some plants that clearly have a, uh, an aromatic character to them not produce an essential oil? Yeah, that, I don't know the answer to that. I'll have to think about that. If you think about apple, you would be distilling the, the, the skin of the apple probably to get that apple scent. 
not the leaves. I think they just well, won't have oil-based scent, maybe water-based or something else. Not it could be, but they're still all volatile. There should it should be possible to distill it. Maybe maybe maybe, maybe the compounds that yeah. um, that are in there are not stable or something. That's a good question though. So you can get a, a synthetic apple, you can get an apple fragrance oil, but not an apple essential oil. It's a very good question. Okay, you have been very kind and left me with a five minute uh, 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 period. Thank you.